Nottingham Friends. Uh, good morning, good morning, everyone. Yeah, uh, I hope everybody can hear me now. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Tara. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah. We had a we had a bit of a uh, technical glitch, which I have, you know, caused this delay. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, very hearty welcome to all of you to the second day of the two-day BNHS MNS event, celebrating the life and work of Dr. Salim Ali. Uh, today's theme is actually uh, Salim Ali in Southern India. Three special guests and five MNS members today will share their experiences interacting and working with uh, Dr. Salim Ali. Our special guests this morning are Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, former administrator, diplomat, and governor. Mrs. Zai Viteka, educator, naturalist, co-founder, Chennai Snake Park, and presently the managing trustee of the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust Center for Hepatology. And Dr. S. Balachandran, deputy director of BNHS, who is synonymous with the BNHS Bird Migration Study Center at uh, Point Calumet. And our very own are uh, Dr. V. Shantaram, Mrs. Uh, Tara Gandhi, Dr. Raghupati Kannan, Mr. K.V. Sudhakar, and uh, Mr. Kumaran Sadashivam. We all now eagerly await to hear their narrations. start by saying uh, thank you very much for uh, including me in this commemoration of uh, Dr. Salim Ali. I am deeply honored. In, in 1974, um, when I was uh, an officer in the government of Tamil Nadu, in the state of Tamil Nadu, I was asked to edit the Pudukote district gazetteer. This was a new gazetteer for a new district. Pudukote, having been uh, merged into Tamil Nadu after independence, had now become a district. And so in the pattern of district gazetteers, uh, the book was to include a significant section on the flora and fauna of the district. And uh, thanks to uh, conversations with my wife, Tara, who is an ornithologist, I uh, thought of inviting Dr. Salim Ali, to do us the great honor of doing a survey of the avi fauna of uh, Pudukote district. And he, uh, to my delight, uh, readily agreed. And in uh, 1975, uh, in the summer and winter of 1975, he made two visits to Pudukote district. He came with uh, J.C. Daniel and with S.A. Hussain, his colleagues in the Bombay Natural History Society. So I was at Trichy Airport to receive him. Pudukote district is wedged between Tiruchirappalli and Tanjau districts. And uh, so I was at the Trichy Airport to receive him. And he came. And as he, as he came into the airport terminal, those days airports were very simple affair. There were no, 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 no security and similar uh, impediments. Uh, and we could go up right to the tarmac. So he came in out to the aircraft and came in. I was seeing him for the first time. I said, sir, did you have a good flight? And he said, waving his hands, he said, yes, I flew very well. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to Dr. Salim Ali. I flew very well. It was a light touch. But he got into work very, very fast with his colleagues, Daniel and, and Hussein. And he was able to tell us uh, after a, uh, a travel round to the Kote on a jeep, in a jeep with, in, in, with which um, uh, um, the state government had provided him. And I was also traveling with him. And he, he, he was able to do a preliminary study, of course, using his binoculars a great deal. And then um, later on, on his return, to prepare a provisional list of birds. And he said to us, and I'm now reading from the from the Pudukote District Gazette, which later appeared. I just hold it up, which is this 
big massive volume, um, uh, uh, this section on birds, he said of the 77 families of birds that comprise the avifauna of the Indian sub-region, about 45 have been recorded in Pudukote district and its environs. This for him perhaps was very uh, um, simple and very straightforward and something that was already known and to him and to other bird watchers and avifauna experts this would not have been something new but for us it was good to get this kind of uh, quantification a very precise quantification and then what what followed was uh, a little narrative which said that this collection of uh, 45 families of birds included residents and migrants for me this was something quite new Pudukote is a very dry district. It has very little water, but it has a few water bodies. And yet, and yet, in the in in the migration pattern of birds, Pudukote did figure. And we learned that after the monsoon, every year now, for instance, we are now having a monsoon, there is a great influx into the district of migrants. I'm reading from beyond Indian limits, which spend the winter months in Pudukote and return to their breeding grounds in the Himalaya and further north, some even up to the Arctic Circle. And then he told us that by the middle of April, most of the winter visitors have left. So this was his, his preliminary observation. And then with Daniel and particularly with Hussein, he drew up a list and sent it to us. And this was a provisional list and we worked on it and put it together and sent it back. And I remember on the next visit, uh, Hussein was very uncomfortable with the way we had done it. He was expressing his discomfort with it to Dr. Salim Ali. And I asked both of them what the problem was because um, we had not departed from the list. We had just put it together. Uh, then Salim Sahib explained it to me. He said, you see, uh, it is, not enough to just put the list of birds down, uh, the families uh, of birds and the details of the birds uh, in any order. Uh, it has to follow a certain order. And then he said, the sequence of orders and families, and I'm again reading, that should be adopted is the sequence given in S. Dillon Ripley's Synopsis of the Birds of India and Pakistan, published in 1961. And this order has now received more or less international acceptance. And unless it follows that order, it is not correct. It is not the way to put it. And then I said, what is so special about that order? And he explained it to me and he said that order, and then we put that into the book also for the reader, that that order starts with the bottom of the evolutionary ladder. It starts at the bottom of the evolutionary ladder and then takes the families of birds step by step to the putatively highest developed forms. And that's how he recast it and he published it finally in the manner which gave him and Hussein complete satisfaction. Now I want to come in here in the few, few minutes that are left to me by saying that this was Tamil Nadu. Hussain incidentally was Tamil speaking. And I must say here um, how, how sorry I have felt and my wife has felt at Hussain's such sudden and premature departure. He, his loss is a very keenly felt loss. Salim, Salim did not know Tamil. Salim Sahib was new to this area, though he had done a book of the birds of Kerala. But Hussain knew Tamil. And so he appreciated our asking the great naturalist and photo naturalist M. Krishnan to come in at this stage and give us the Tamil names for each of the birds that Salim Sahib and Hussain and Daniel had given to us. So in the longer list, in the descriptive sections, we gave the names of the birds in English, 
the scientific names and the names in Tamil, which Krishna invariably explained also with a reference to some literary text or some other knowledge of his own about the behavior of those birds. For instance, in the subject of, uh, in the entry on the Indian darter or the snake bird, Salim Sahab's description was very simple and clear. The Indian darter, snake bird, scientific name, Anhinga Rufa. Now then, Krishna went on to say that in Tamil it is called Pamb Tara, which means the snake star. In Tamil, this is closely related to the cormorants. And then the description was by Salim Sahab. It has a narrow head and a characteristically long and thin S-shaped neck which sticks like a snake out of the water when the bird is swimming half submerged. Now, Krishnan's description Pambatara and Salim Sahab's description of this S snake like neck brought that bird alive. Similarly, on the paddy bird, which is extensively seen in Pudukote, the paddy bird or the pond heron. Krishnan said it is called in Tamil Madayan. Madayan, a very old Tamil phrase called Madayan, which indicates its habit of haunting small irrigation gutters, which are called Madaihal. And so Madayan. And then Salim Sahib was very, very fond of Aitken, Iha. And Iha's immortal description of the pond heron, it suddenly produces a pair of snowy wings from its pockets and flaps away. And then we understood why Asylum Sahib told us for the book that in the Far East, American visitors call the paddy bird the surprise bird. I'll now round off by coming to a different theater of Asylum Sahib's work in Pudukoti which was not about seeing real birds, but about seeing birds on a fresco in the Sittanavasal caves, the famous Jaina caves um, of the post-Gupta period uh, in the district. There is a fresco there which shows the scene called Samavasarana. It's a Jaina theme, a pond with much flora in it, broad leaves, flowers, lotuses, and birds. So we asked Salim Sahib to identify some of the birds in that fresco. Salim Sahib gave us a very precise note. And I read, the lotuses, elephants, buffaloes, and fish in the paintings are obvious enough. But, and this is the, the most beautiful part of Salim Sahib's description, but on what basis the birds have been identified as ducks, geese, and saras? I am totally unable to comprehend. They have been identified by non-ornithologists, by lay observers, as ducks and geese and saras. To anybody's eyes, like, for instance, my eyes, they look like ducks. But Salim Sahib says, on what basis the birds have been identified as ducks, geese, and saras, I'm totally unable to comprehend, except for the fact that they are shown on a lotus pond, except for the fact that they're shown on a lotus pond, I see nothing in the figures themselves to suggest these birds. The bills are distinctively pointed, not flat and blunt as in a duck. The feet where visible are not webbed, and moreover show a boss on the tarsus, which looks singularly like a short, blunt, present in the pheasant and partridge family. So this was the first time that an ornithologist had looked at this painting, famous painting, a beautiful painting. It has 
lasted for centuries from the point of view of the science of ornithology. Krishnan, and then he came in. Krishnan said about the bird, it is some kind of a lesser whistling teal above the tarsus and a bird of prey beneath that point, most probably a hawk. No such kind of bird exists. And then in typical Christian way, he said, but what of that? What of that? Salimali and Krishnan studied the paintings from the viewpoint of their scientific disciplines and from their observation of nature. Both have enriched the work. And I will say goodbye by just narrating one small feature of Salim Sahib's contribution to the bird part of this book. And that is this. It has nothing to do with birds. It has everything to do with interest, with liveliness. Here was a man in advanced years coming to a new terrain with the enthusiasm of a child struck by wonder with nature. He did not come expecting to see something unusual. He did not come looking for something which is mind-blowing. But for him, everything which is to do with birds or what birds eat, where they live, how they behave, was as if he was seeing it for the first time. Whatever, though known to him, when it revealed itself for the nth time, he saw as if he was seeing it for the first time. And he described it with precision and the, dis and the joy of a new discovery. Traveling with Salim Sahib and with Hussain in Pudukote has been for me the experience of a lifetime. I thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this celebration of Salim Amu's work. And I think what I'm going to do is play uh, a game that we used to play as children. It's called a game of three. And I'm going to uh, do three things in three in different categories around Salim Amu's life. Uh, for example, three objects of importance to him, three habits, and so on. So I'm going to start with the object. And the first one, of course, is his uh, motorcycle, which he adored. It was his dearest friend until he got married and probably after Tahmina's death. And the one I remember best is... Uh, it was probably his sunbeam, which he had in uh, Pali Hill when he was living with my parents. And it had a sidecar. And we kids used to clamor to be taken for rides. And uh, so he'd take us up Pali Hill or along the Bandra bandstand. And we used to uh, really enjoy those rides. And I must say here that he was... <clears throat> Sorry, he was a much better um, motorcycle driver than he was a Jeep driver because that's the second object I want to talk about, his Willie's Jeep, which was donated by his friend and supporter, Lok Wan Tho, the um, Singapore millionaire who was interned in Bombay, I think, during the war. So we were all, there was great excitement when the Jeep came uh, and we used to love driving in it with him. But as we grew older, we realized what a terrible driver he was. And um, 
more and more when he offered to take us to school or somewhere else where uh, we were off to, we would politely decline because um, he, his judgment was terrible. And um, it was just a series of near misses, the type of drive where all the passengers are just sort of crouched in a corner, uh, probably praying madly. Um, and the third thing was, of course, his gun and his guns and especially his one special gun. I can't remember what it was actually, but that was the center of uh, all the bird knowledge that we have today and the focus, the pivot of his uh, book of Indian birds. Uh, going on to three habits that I remember well, one was neatness. We spent a lot of time at our grandmother's uh, house uh, with Salemamu. And uh, the spaces around him, his office, his bedroom, his cupboards were never untidy. And this was true of his little uh, jhopra and kihim as well. We all had these jhopras or huts. He had the simplest one. And it was always meticulously neat and clean. His books, his few clothes, his little typewriter, all very carefully kept, nicely cleaned. Um, and also he, his simplicity, he didn't have too many things. He was off from, firstly, he was from the generation which uh, didn't buy a lot of excess stuff. They didn't go shopping and buy something they liked. They bought things that they needed. And uh, after Salamamu's death, one of my cousins went to pick up his personal effects. And I remember him telling me that there were so few things, you know, his three or four shirts, his shorts, his one or two pairs of shoes, uh, those were the days when the mochi or the cobbler came once a week and everyone ran out with their chappals and shoes to be repaired. You did not go out and buy a new pair when there was a rip in the strap or, you know, the sole uh, was worn out. Um, and the third thing I remember very well is his punctuality. And that was one of the times he could blow, her, blow, her, blow a fuse. So uh, when we went bird watching to Burivli National Park, well, not National Park in those days, but to Burivli Sanctuary, uh, my father used to be very, very particular about all of us getting up on time and being at that Andheri turn off well before his Jeep came around the corner. Um, all good habits for us uh, to follow, I think. And uh, three characteristics of Salemamu. One was his discipline, which of course has been talked about uh, a lot. Five o'clock in the morning on the dot, his typewriter would be clacking away. And um, nothing was allowed to come in the way of his work. Um, so that self-motivation, that focus was incredible. Also his integrity, he was an extremely um, honest man. We, uh, I remember somebody saying at one point that it was a good thing that he didn't live to see the crookery of his uh, of Colonel Minot Sagan, which, uh, who was one of his bird watching associates, I won't say friends, but they went to Afghanistan together, I think on a bird collection trip. And he certainly admired him though, um, as I say, I don't think they were, they became close friends. But uh, what Colonel Minot Sagan did uh, in terms of tampering with the bird specimens would have really appalled uh, Salimamo. 
And of course, Salimamu's sense of humor, which is uh, always, you know, difficult when people say, give us some examples of jokes he made, because so much of his humor was uh, A, related to his gestures, uh, the way he spoke, his expressions, and also the fact that most of the time or very often it was uh, making fun of himself. And uh, that is something that whole bunch of siblings did, nine of them, very self-deprecating, uh, very, very uh, humble uh, people. And so it was very contextual. It's very difficult for us to report his humor because it was uh, contextual of that moment, of that situation. Uh, three favorite foods, and I'm tempted to say mango, mango, and mango because that's what he loved best. Uh, and my grandparents had an Alfonso orchard at the back in Kihim. So when we went there for summers, summer holidays, Salimamu would be there and really enjoying uh, the mangoes. He had a tremendous appetite and a tremendous capacity to eat and eat and not put on any weight. So as we grew older and started worrying about our weight and dieting and so on, we were very envious of him. He also loved the peanut brittle or chicky that my grandparents cook Ibrahim made. Uh, a delicious but very, very um, hard on the teeth. So while several other aunts and uncles would be, uh, you know, holding their jaw or uh, cracking teeth, Salimamu, who had very strong teeth, was able to eat up quantities of the stuff without any problem at all. And he also loved dhansak, the it's a Parsi dish. And I remember him saying that uh, he loves his Parsi bird watching friends because they always bring dhansak uh, on picnics and certainly did if requested by him. So these were three things he enjoyed uh, very much. Three places he liked, I would say probably Kihim uh, is on top of the list because apart from being an extraordinarily beautiful place, still, in spite of all the development, that was where he did his seminal Baya study, Weaver Bird study. So I think it had a very special place in his heart and mind. Bharatpur might have been the second one. And then 43 Pali Hill, where he moved after Tehmina's death. Uh, apparently he'd come for a visit and my uh, grandmother said, look, why don't you just stay on with us? Because it's going to be lonely in Dehradun. And uh, that's what he did. It was a beautiful house and garden, and he had a nice, pleasant, uh, large set of rooms. Um, and there's a lovely photograph of uh, 43 Pali Hill in his book, which I have read several times, um, as much for the language as anything else, because um, he was a fantastic writer. And that brings me to an interesting point that um, my mother once said that Tehmina, his wife, had something substantial to do with the development of Salimamu's uh, writing style in natural history. She herself had been to school in England and I'm sure that writing skills were a it were a very important part of the curriculum there. And of course, she was with him when he started writing the book of Indian birds. So she, he must have read out portions to her and she must have critiqued them. And uh, this is something that it would be interesting for me personally to actually talk to people in the family and find out more about her and maybe write something about it. 
because she obviously played a very important part in his uh, life and work. Um, I'd like to mention two other books. Uh, one is this children's story called uh, Salimamu and Me, which I call my autobiography because it's about growing up with Salimamu and um, growing up also among um, a gang of extremely avid and learned uh, and knowledgeable bird watchers and knowing very little myself, which is still the case, by the way. So um, how, how that was as a child, um, and this came out two or three years ago. And um, another book I did on Salem Amu is called Salem Ali for Schools, uh, which is a simplified uh, biography of his. I'd like to uh, end with three points of inspiration for me personally, um, which stem from Salim Amu's life and work. Uh, the first one is that uh, I think he was an exceptional mentor. Uh, and we watched him with his own students. Uh, he was, of course, a PhD and a guide. Uh, and with uh, people from the family and his patience and his dedication to, you know, his wanting to pass on as much of his own excitement and information, I think is something that we all need to think about and um, remember as we talk to younger people around us. Uh, the second one, and this is something that the whole bunch of BNHS people seem to have, is uh, what I call cause above ego. Um, as committee members, for instance, they were able to dialogue with people, work with people they didn't uh, have a personal liking for at all. In fact, sometimes not at all, but were able to work with them because the cause was important. And I think this again is something that, uh, you know, we need to all of us think about. And the last is his passion and his focus. Nothing came in the way of his work. Nothing was allowed to. And um, that again is something that, um, you know, I wish I had more of his discipline and focus. And uh, as I get older, I try to think more about it and assimilate it a little more. So the uh, key word there is try to. I haven't been very successful so far. But anyway, all these things, everything about him, all the points that uh, I've mentioned are things that I think uh, would enrich our own lives. And that th this is what makes him such a fantastic role model for all of us interested in conservation and natural history. Good morning Great. to everybody. Uh, I am very glad to share my experience with Dr. Salim Ali uh, with all of you people since I had the opportunity with him uh, to work for more than four years and so, so I didn't know Salim Ali when I joined B, G, BNHS. I was told by uh, one of my professors when I shown that uh, the interview for the research assistant post in BNHS appeared in the Hindu paper. I took the cutting to my professor uh, to get me to apply for that one because they have asked for a small write-up on some observation on any wild animals. Then, uh, but I, I saw this uh, photo because my professor was the one of his uh, uh, fans and uh, then uh, he displayed this photo also but didn't, I didn't, in the, uh, our zoology laboratory, but I didn't care to listen that his name also okay so 
so I, when i came to bnhi i was very raw about the uh, wildlife but being uh, being belonging to the rural area where i am belonging to a small village very close to kanyakumari which is the district is uh, have, uh, otherwise called as the district of ponds so many ponds where we can see lot of water birds but we used to see the birds without knowing the english name but we my father also little bit know about this many birds because he used to assist one of the hunter so my father was a teacher so he used to uh, tell about so many birds uh, and local names and uh, Uh, since the i also while studying while studying i used to go to the paddy field for to work with my father to so it had it, it gave enough opportunity for me to uh, watch birds without knowing the names but when i uh, when i appeared for that bnhs interview somebody questioned me then about to know about identification skill and pro then i i could answer many bird, local uh, name of the birds so they impressed i they got into the post and then when they when they sent to that uh, point kalimar where we have seen that almost several lakhs of birds particularly i joined in november that in several lakhs of birds and before that when after the interview we were introduced to uh, dr salibeli that time first time i saw salimeli in his cabin and we five people selected were taken to him and got introduced to him and then i i sent to point kalimar for that uh, bird migration project which was going under his supervision okay but point kalimar attracted me towards birds and within a, within a few days i could able to identify 50 species since i know the local names of several species so then immediately i learned the english name that way i started my bird watching skill very uh, efficiently later to by working conducting bird ringing program all over india also so i have uh, uh, expanded my identification skill okay and uh, then uh, in the 19 83 i joined in 1981 83 one uh, we had a uh, camp at uh, uh, summer ring camp at uh, kodekanal where dr salimeli visited for a briefly because of lack of time he could not come out of the car and i have i kept so many birds in my hand with the, the bird back and i was showing one by one to him and still i remember that uh, yeah, one white belly shot wing which i had given to him but and it was okay picking his wrinkled skin very strongly and the old man was laughing very nicely still i remember the uh, smiling face of salimeli and also then later two times he came with the us experts to point kalimar and uh, that time also Uh, I, I because being a senior uh, bird watcher in our project who can identify well birds like that i was sent along with dr salimeli to that uh, walk along the uh, swamp then i took him i walked along with him he saw and and it was uh, amazing to hear he was asking me what were what the terns were flying over the water then i told sir sir they are listed terns like that and then he was asking some question about the local people catching fish and uh, by hand then he was asking what these women were doing like that because it was a good opportunity i was alone with him then we were walking for about 10 minutes then we came back and see some birds and come back and next day then he was taken to the uh in the forest and while coming out of the forest if you want to go to the beach you have to cross a small creek by boat then uh, then uh, the boat the, there was a boat uh, uh, but no boatmen were there okay then 
we put salim ali into the boat and i uh, what I, i tied the rope over my waist and i swam and took uh, came to the other side of the uh, other side of the uh, creek and then when i tried to help him to give a hand to get him out of the boat he pushed my hand so that much that time it was almost he was uh, eight, probably maybe 88 i think and so that time also he was so confident of our uh, taking care himself okay so th th that's another then uh, the one of the days then we were doing the shorebird ringing in that area but uh, we, uh, then he was calmly watching sitting by uh, uh, the ringing operation then i know when i uh, because it was in that uh, 85 the next trip actually then that time we were thought about uh, how to age the birds age mean previously the technology was not taught to us how to age means how we can easily differentiate the young bird from the adult bird based on the juvenile plumage characters it was uh, then i when i explained to him about the age and this one and the molt pattern then he told i am not aware of all those things uh, like that in those then i took a bill gates uh, sir this is uh, already known to us we didn't follow it up sir that one and this is a very good uh, techniques to find out the recruitment rate of this shore birds which breeds in the arctic okay so the, these are some of my good experiences with him and when uh, when we go to the guest house to meet him and we were waiting outside then he will uh, come with always a, a what a, a box of chenna that fried chenna this is the favorite food of him always he used to uh, eat on uh, then he always opened that box and gave to all our colleagues like that so now actually when he was alive we didn't realize his what significance then after then his death only then we really started realizing how we missed several opportunities with salim ali which is the whole world is talking about his uh, contribution that's a mistakes i we feel like that we made we lost the mistake another thing also then I, actually he agreed to be one of the uh, uh, go guide for my phd degree then he was questioning because his uh, topic is marine so not, not a marine actually also i have then marine birds like that then i we could convince him then he agreed on that condition only my phd guide also agreed uh, uh, for this uh, uh, guide ship so salim ali was so kind enough to give me a father and fortunately before that registration happened he died it and so these are all my experience with him also and also one more experience we can tell also when salim ali visit point kalemar who whenever he stays in the uh, guest house some local uh, politicians or vips used to come and see him and then one on one day that politician put a question to him that why you want to study birds like then he put the answer like that birds are really giving warning to us because once the birds extinct from the world human cannot also survive in this world that's a answer he told to, told to him okay and uh, so these are all that is just a experience with him on uh, him and uh, uh, otherwise i don't have and one more incident if you want i can remember before when actually we went to uh, delhi for a meeting and uh, at that time salim ali was sitting this in front of the guests who were staying with the, all people like the mr daniel and uh, hussain and our dr sugadan like that and but where salim ali was sitting he was sitting in front of a motor bike and uh, kick uh, that he is trying to start with his hand the kick starter how much ability he has got that two wheel rider that what that time when he was uh, 
pull, uh, pushing that uh, Kickstarter. That time I just ended. Then Mr. Daniel uh, introduced the Bala from Rameshwaram area. He is doing his uh, postal box has come and that. That's the last time I have seen him. Also, the same. Next day, uh, next day was the meeting actually to decide about the setting up of your uh, bird migration that bird research center to uh, he was very concerned about the uh, all our uh, scientists who were working in projects what would happen to their future in after the projects got over so that what he was negotiating with the government to get a exclusive ornithology research center that time uh, he, he, we have arranged a small seminar like that in uh, delhi so that former uh, Prime Minister late Rajiv Gandhi supposed to come and uh, inaugurate that one. That time, on the previous night that day, I told I told that when he was sitting with a uh, motorbike and this one, it's previous and that night itself he collapsed, so he could not attend the Rajiv Gandhi meeting also. So that that one, that, so that one, you know, many people uh, talked about he is very fond of riding motorbike, and I I was I am. I am also fortunate to use his, one of his uh, vehicles he used, that one Java. It was, uh, left, it was lying in the Point Kalimar Center for so many years. I also uh, rode that mo uh, bike for many years, even in uh, Point Kalimar as well as at Rameshwaram also. Right. Uh, in the meeting, Rajiv Gandhi announced that uh, there will be a center, will be set up for to accommodate the young scientist uh, uh, almost like to absorb in the government like that but that's a center now functioning as the salimeli center for ornithology and naturalistic uh, uh, popularly called as second okay. so this is the uh, second story actually how second was uh, uh, conceptualized and then it uh, was established. I'm thankful to the Morgan Natural History Society and Madras Natural Society for giving me this opportunity to talk about Dr. Sarimali and my association with him. I had known of Dr. Sarimali uh, and uh, had read his articles and came across his books uh, from my school days. Uh, and uh, my first uh, contact with him happened in 1979 when I first wrote to him. Uh, I had also met him in Chennai, heard it with him a couple of times in Chennai to Indian National Park and uh, Theosophical Society and and had uh, corresponded with him on uh, a few matters connected with the birds of Chennai. Uh, it was a privilege meeting him and interacting with him and he was such a considerate person. Uh, he wouldn't uh, look at you as someone who is new but he would be in encouraging you to do things uh, as you might be able to see through the presentation. Uh, the first time I wrote to him was in 1978 uh, when we had a setting of the frigate bird and this is uh, this was his response. Uh, so he was very keen uh, that uh, you know we don't jump to the names of the birds, but uh, try and look at the characteristics. And and he was not uh, willing to commit uh, or identify the species, but he asked us to go ahead and look at the book and see whether we can recognize it. Uh, but he did recognize uh, uh, the fact that this was, we were trying to uh, write something. Uh, we were. Uh, that uh, we had noted something which was unusual. Uh, the second letter I uh, exchanged with him was in 79, 
1979, when we saw the yellow-throated bulbul, it was in fact uh, seen by Mr. Koneri Long, and we had visited uh, Jinji in December 1979, where we again saw this bird, and uh, we wrote to him, and this is his response. He said, please observe carefully and try to identify the ecological factors that make the distribution of this bird patch. He also wanted to know whether uh, white broad bulbul also occurred in the same locality and what were the other species of bulbuls associated. So he was uh, advocating a scientific and ecological approach to the whole uh, study of birds and not just you know mere listing of birds, which is what is being unfortunately being pursued these days in the name of bird watching. Uh, the first opportunity for us for me to meet him came in 1980 when we met him at uh, in Chennai. Uh, it was a brief meeting because he was passing through Chennai and he was on his way to, I think, Point Calimar. And uh, on behalf of the Madras Naturalist Society, we organized uh, a short uh, interview for the Doodarshan and Mr. Harry Miller of uh, the famous photographer from Indian Express was uh, was uh, asked to interview him. Uh, so we had a very brief meeting with him on that occasion. Uh, but again, uh, in soon after 1982, February, he passed through Chennai on his way to Point Kalima. And this time he came along with uh, a few of his colleagues, uh, Dr. Mr. J.C. Daniel was there, Mr. S.A. Hussain, Dr. Robert Grubb, and uh, so they, they were on their way to Point Kalima, I think, and uh, they spent a day and uh, we had this rare opportunity of taking him to the Theosophical Society and we watched some birds uh, and we were trying to impress on him the, the importance of the Adair history and whether uh, it could be protected as a bird preserve. So his response was uh, just by putting a board and uh, declaring this place as a bird sanctuary, it may not uh, really cause hindrance to aircraft. So why is there an objection from the government to go ahead and protect this place? So uh, he he was quite supportive of uh, you know, conservation at the local level, and he encouraged us to observe more on the birds there. So this is the write-up in the Madras Naturalist Society bulletin, uh, and I think there was also a suggestion from some of our members where we could uh, do some bird ringing in uh, Chennai and, uh, his, and this was the response that we, if we could get a few people to come over to Point Kalimar and get uh, trained for four weeks, uh, we could probably think of uh, starting a bird ringing station in Adia Registry. But anyway, this didn't really work out. Uh, this is me with uh, Dr. Salim Ali when he came to Chennai when I met him for the last time in 1983. He had come with uh, Professor Christopher Perrins of the Edward Gray Institute of Ornithology and uh, together they addressed our Madras Naturalist Society members and uh, although Dr. Sari Mali did not give a talk, he was able to answer a few questions uh, raised by the audience. This is again a photograph of uh, Dr. Sani Malik, members of the Madras Naturalist Society, including who is standing very next to Dr. Sani uh, The In 1983, we had an opportunity to uh, again watch birds in his company at the Gindi National Park. And this time, Raghupati uh, uh, Kanan, who later on went to study the hornbills, uh, myself and Tara Gandhi, who was his uh, MSc student, his last MSc student, who did MSc through dissertation. So we were the people who went to the Hindi National Park. And uh, although he was not able to hear uh, uh, clearly the bird calls, uh, with his uh, experience, he was able to guess the bird. So he would uh, listen to a call and said, is this not the white brown bulbul? And it was, of course, the white bird bulbul. So he was able to connect with the birds despite his uh, inability to hear properly. But uh, he was uh, very sharp and he knew his birds very well. Uh, in 1984, I sent a 
a copy of uh, a draft checklist of birds of my class which I had prepared. We had about uh, 250 to 300 species of birds and uh, asked him whether uh, uh, for his opinion and this is his response. So he said uh, it would be nice to print it out like the checklist of Maharashtra and he sent a copy of that uh, checklist to me. Uh, the last three letters I had uh, exchanged with him uh, were with, uh, in connection with the uh, Ashi Minivet, which was cited in Chennai. So uh, before my record in 1984, there were uh, two, just two other records of the Ashi Minivet in India. One was from Andamans and the other was from somewhere in Maharashtra. And so when I had uh, written about this in the Black Buck, uh, Dr. Salim, it caught the Salim Ali. Dr. Sarimali's attention and uh, he wrote uh, to me uh, saying that uh, I believe you have taken a photo color photograph of the bird. Would it be possible for you to send it across and uh, I'll be willing to pay for the cost in case there's anything to be paid for? It was uh, very gracious of this uh, person. And uh, I sent him the photographs. Uh, immediately. There were actually slides and then I had to convert them into uh, prints and then send them uh, with the comment that they were not very clear but uh, you could just take a look and so this is what he said. Uh, he said it may not be, uh, it's not very clear as you had mentioned the photographs but uh, along with the descriptions uh, they appear to be Ashim Inuit. So please send a note on this to the Journal of Bombay National Society. So I wrote this uh, short note and it was uh, published in the JPNHS. And uh, my last letter uh, with him, uh, correspondence with him was on in 1985, when again I had uh, written to him in response to my letter, uh, asking, uh, telling, informing him of the subsequent sighting of the Ashim Inuit in 1985. And he's, he was quite thrilled and he said, I am going to be in Chennai for a talk in IIT on January 8, 1986. So I would like to meet you and discuss further on this. Uh, but unfortunately, on uh, that particular day when I went to IIT, I was told the talk was cancelled because Dr. Sanimal was not well. And uh, I did not correspond with him after that. Uh, but I was uh, following his, uh, you know, uh, that he had moved over to Kim and uh, he was not keeping well. And but uh, I also heard uh, subsequently that uh, he was diagnosed with cancer and uh, he was uh, hospitalized. And uh, the was a coincidence that uh, the day before. The day on which I left for Pondicherry to join, uh, to write the inter uh, entrance exam of the Pondicherry University, which offered a uh, MSc in uh, ecology, and it was open to people from any discipline. And I had done commerce for my graduation. So to get into uh, research in biology was to me an you know, out of question, but uh, this. Uh, opening which was offered by the Pondicherry University was something very uh, was something interesting and I thought I should uh, try my luck in getting into this and uh, the day I was leaving for the uh, entrance exam uh, I heard the news that Dr. Salim Lee passed away this was in June 1987 he passed away in uh, the hospital uh, after uh, being admitted there for ailment. Uh, when I had the opportunity of meeting Dr. Salim Ali in Tara Gandhi's house in 1983, December, uh, we had discussed with him about uh, getting into uh, ecology and becoming an ornithologist as taking it up as a profession. And uh, he had mentioned that, uh, yes, it's a nice thing for people interested in ornithology to become but the problem was there are very little remuneration and uh, very few opportunities to make it as a career. Uh, he was quite right because uh, I still find that despite the fact that uh, there is a lot of demand for 
environmental protection and uh, people to uh, know be in this field, it's not very easy to uh, get an opportunity to make a career out of this. And it's only people who are really interested who can uh, do this on a long term basis and sustain themselves. Uh, anyway, I think uh, it was uh, my great fortune to have uh, met Dr. Salimani and uh, been in correspondence with him and also have uh, photographs of him taken uh, on these occasions. And I think these memories are, uh, are something that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to discuss uh, and share this information with you. So thank you. The tale I recount about Dr. Salim Ali is also about the BNHS and the MNS. I became acquainted with the name of Dr. Salim Ali when I was in school. At that time, the, my sources of information about nature and naturalists were primarily books. In the school library, for instance, there was a, an illustrated book on birds, one that had been co-authored by Dr. Salim Ali. My other source of information was uh, newspapers and magazines. And in these, there would be the occasional article on wildlife. I treasured these articles um, a lot. And so I used to clip them and collect them. Uh, and uh, this habit uh, continued beyond my school days. After school, after my school days, I joined IIT Madras as a student. And in my second or third year there, I came across a, a very eye-catching article in the newspaper. It was large and it had colorful photographs, one of which showed Dr. Salim Ali studying a tray full of very colorful bird specimens. The article said that there was an institution known as the Bombay Natural History Society, the BNHS for short, which was celebrating its centenary that year. I put away the newspaper without giving a newspaper article without giving it much thought. But within a year, my class and I had to go to Bombay for a month long training program. And I remembered the BNHS. At the first opportunity that presented itself, I went over to the BNHS. And I was surprised by the warmth of the welcome uh, that awaited me. I was invited to look around Hornville House, their headquarters. And at one point, I wandered into the bird collection room. And as someone showed me the bird specimens in their cabinets, I realized that these were the source of the bird specimens that Dr. Salim Ali had been studying in the photograph. I found the BNHS so fascinating that I visited it repeatedly during my stay at Bombay. And during one of the visits, I bought myself a copy of a book of Indian birds by Dr. Salim Ali. I put it to use right away. We were staying in the IIT Bombay campus for our stay. And um, we were able to identify a number of birds, including uh, a number of water birds that were uh, wading in the Lake Powai, which, which uh, is adjacent to the IIT Bombay campus. So in that, in that day, Dr. Salim Ali had transformed me from being an armchair naturalist into a bird watcher who went out into the field. On another visit to the BNHS, I found a couple of international visitors looking around in the bird collection room. Um, again, I did not give this much thought, but the next day I found these same two gentlemen in a photograph in the local newspaper. I was quite surprised. And looking closely, I realized that Dr. Salim Ali was standing next to them in the photograph. And it turns out that the two visitors were from the Smithsonian. And they had come all the way from the US to India to give 
to present Dr. Salim Ali an award. Had I known that this was going to happen, the previous day I would have stayed back and um, watched the award ceremony and um, hopefully met Dr. Salim Ali. On the last visit to the BNHS, I inquired about membership so that I could stay associated with the BNHS. The staff member gave me the details I needed and almost casually said that there was a local organization at Madras, which I might be interested in joining as well. And that staff member gave me a pamphlet. So on returning to IIT for the next semester, I wrote to the address given in that pamphlet. And soon enough, I got a letter in response from Mr. V. J. Rajan, who was the honorary secretary of the organization involved, namely the Madras Naturalist Society, MNS. Apparently, the MNS met every month on the second Sunday at the Children's Park of the Gindi National Park. Mr. Rajan invited me to visit uh, the Children's Park for the next meeting. So I went. And there, there were a number of naturalists uh, at the meeting. One of them, Mr. Govind Kumar, introduced me to the other members, including Santaram, whom he introduced as the best field ornithologist in India. To put things in a nutshell, this was the beginning of a rabidly fanatic period of bird watching for me. I had Dr. Salim Ali's book in hand. I had the IIT campus in which to watch birds. And I had naturalists, naturalists like, like Santaram, whom I could uh, bombard with questions. At this phase, I suggested to Kishore Rajagopal, the student uh, general secretary of IIT, that uh, we call Dr. Salim Ali over for a talk. IIT had this uh, week system of uh, weekly extramural lectures, which were held uh, every Wednesday afternoon in the Central Lecture Theatre. Kishore thought it was a good idea and organized the talk. Unfortunately, as Santaram said, now that talk did not happen. So every time I think about Dr. Salim Ali, I reflect on how he was responsible for stimulating in me a keen interest in bird watching through the BNHS, his book, and the MNS. And I also think about how I played a role in almost bringing Dr. Salim Ali on a visit to Madras. Happily, I go through Dr. Salim Ali's writings repeatedly, and I would like to end this narration with something that I discovered about him when going through his publications in the journal of the BNHS. Do you know what his first publication in that journal was? Was it about the Baya weaver bird, which is associated with him? No. Was it about the yellow-throated sparrow, which he is famous for? No, not that. It was not even a bird that he wrote about in his first note in the journal. His first note appeared in the journal in 1926, and it was about the gaur. Specifically, it was about a solitary cow gaur that he came across in Burma during his days there. Thank you. I'm Tara Gandhi, and Dr. Salim Ali was my teacher and my mentor. Um, and I had the special privilege of being his very last student. You know, he was already 87 years old when he took me on as his student. And he warned me. He said, look, I may not be alive to see you through your master's degree. And so you better hurry up and get it done really fast. So that was how uh, I was initiated into uh, being a student of Dr. Salim Ali's. 
and since I was living in in Madras, what is what we call it Chennai now, of course, but I continue to say Madras because that was those times it was called Madras and Bombay. So he assigned me uh, the topic of a comparative study of birds in uh, commercial plantations, monoculture plantations, and uh, natural vegetation around the city. Uh, he was very concerned, you know, that all along the Coromandel coast, the scrub jungle, the natural uh, forests were being decimated and converted into commercial plantations of, uh, of uh, casuarina, uh, eucalyptus, and uh, cashew, and various such uh, commercial uh, uh, tree species. And he wanted to know what was the impact of that on the bird life of the area. So this was the topic that I had been assigned. And he agreed to my great joy to uh, be my, my guide. So what could have been better than that? It was something that was so wonderful. But getting there was no easy job. Getting to that point where he, could, he actually accepted me as a student was actually a rough path. Literally, sometimes, which I'll come to you a little later about. So, you see, he was skeptical in the beginning whether I could be, you know, whether, whether I had the capacity to do uh, the kind of tough work that was involved in a field research study. You see, because I was not like his usual students who were fresh graduates or, uh, you know, young uh, PhD scholars, aspirants. I was a 33-year-old married woman with a family, two children, school-going children. So naturally, he was he was um, quite you know skeptical whether I would be able to do the do this kind of whether I deliver the goods whether I'd be able to do a master's study. So what he did was before before registering me as a student, he packed me off to Point Calumet. Uh, to the BNHS field research station there uh, for a kind of a training program. After reaching there, I realized it was not just a training program, but it was also a kind of an entrance exam for me. He had set up with S.A. Hussain, who was there, to actually watch and to see whether this person who was coming as a potential student had it had the uh, okay, had the potential to actually be a research scholar so i was put through my paces and sort of like an endurance test and uh, actually mr hussein he you know it's like every other every other researcher there walk walk in the sun and on boulders and rocks and uh, the rain and puddles and uh, camping out and and surviving on very basic food. So all that, he put me through those paces. And I have to admit, it was quite tough. It was quite tough for me uh, because I had never done anything like in my life before. But maybe because I was so enthusiastic and maybe because I was so keen that eventually, I think Hussein, thank, thanks to him very much that he must have given a good report and and Dr. Sally Mali accepted me at last. So he then back in back in Madras, I uh, had to start a pilot study. So I chose um, Gindi National Park, and I, for three months I did some records, you know, on my own, recording the birds, recording the plants, recording whatever I was supposed to be having to do. And and it was kind of like a it's like kind of a correspondence course because Dr. Sally Mali was in Bombay. And I was here in Chennai, and uh, so he couldn't be there the whole time. He, uh, he expected me to send him reports every week, which he would read and he would correct right down to the last comma and last spelling mistake he would correct it. But to my dismay, I found his letters were really scathing. He didn't approve of my work at all. He said, your work is dilettante, it's not detailed enough, and if you don't improve, you're not you're going to be doing injustice to yourself as well as to the funders. You see, they had awarded me a Salim Ali Lok Fellowship as well. 
so I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to do. I, I was terrified that the you know funding be taken away from me and that I would not be allowed to continue. Uh, but fortuitously and providentially for me, Dr. Salim Ali actually came to Madras at that time. Uh, and he then uh, saw that I was kind of floundering and he introduced me to um, Dr. Sanjeev Raj and to Bill Harvey and he requested them to sort of help me out. And it's only then that my research took off in a better way. They both, uh, you know, really regularized my work. They organized it for me and members of the MNS, uh, my dear old friends, uh, Kannan and B. Shantaram, Raghupati Kannan and Shantaram, they helped me as well. And that was when I was able to actually start properly and identify good uh, study sites in Wandalur and along the East Coast Road and start getting my work done. Later on, Dr. Sanjeev Raj and Mr. Bill Harvey both told me you know, that we would not even have bothered to be of any, to, to even see you or meet you, but it's only because Dr. Salim Ali introduced you to us uh, to, uh, that, that we took an interest and uh, gave and helped you out. So it's just so remarkable that that was the kind of level of his, uh, the regard that he was held in, that they were willing to spare time and effort and energy just to help out one of the students. And that was a big blessing for me. So throughout the two years of my research work, Dr. Sally Mari made just one or two trips down to uh, Madras. And he would stay with us uh, in my family, in my home. With, and um, actually, we were quite nervous because he was 88, 89 years old that time. And we were very worried for his well-being and for his health. But, you know, in the morning, he'd be bright and ready to go out to the field. And uh, he would uh, spend the whole day out and then come back in the evening and relax with us, with me and my husband and my children, you know, engaging us in the most educative conversation and also uh, touch with a bit of here and there. So one day, actually, one evening, uh, one of my photo uh, keen photographer friends came and did a slideshow for him. And uh, so he enjoyed that. He sat through it. Was, it was actually quite a short slideshow. So when it finished, he's saying, is that all? I want my money back. So this is the kind of uh, wonderful equation that he had with his students. He could be very harsh. He could be very strict. He could be, uh, uh, he had very demanding and ex expecting of very high standards. And that is how a teacher should be. That is how he was as a teacher. At the same time, he could, you know, give us the kind of warmth and affection, uh, a personal, which, we, which a student needed. So this is how it went on. And for me, the defining moment in my life uh, was when I was able to actually hand over my thesis to him. And, uh, and that, at that time, he was about uh, 90 years old and quite frail, as uh, you can see from this picture in my bookshelf. Which I, which I treasure, uh, but he read it word to word. He read my thesis word for word, and he put his approval signature at the end, and for which I shall be ever grateful. Working for Dr. Salim Ali, in uh, one of the world's most renowned bird sanctuaries, the Kailaria Ghana National Park in Bharatpur, is my honor and privilege. It's one of the crowning accomplishments in my life, although it was very early in my career. In fact, the BNHS job that Dr. Salim Ali gave me was my very first job. And uh, to this day, I have very fond memories of my nearly two years that I spent in Bharatpur. So I was selected by the BNHS in September 1983. That's when I met the old man, as we affectionately called him, for the first time in, in, in Bombay. 
uh, I didn't have time and he didn't have time to spend uh, any, uh, any amount of time with me at that time. But uh, I came back to Chennai after my interview with Mr. Daniel. And uh, the day before I left for Bharatpur in uh, December 1983, I went birding with Dr. Salim Ali, with uh, Dr. Santaram and uh, Mrs. Tara Gandhi uh, to Gindi National Park. Uh, he knew that I had gotten accepted. He knew that I was leaving the very next day. And uh, it was such an honor to go birding with them for the very first time. I was just a teenager at that time. And uh, I was so excited, so honored to be in uh, the co company of such great birders, especially Dr. Salim Ali. Uh, I clearly remember the two hours or so we spent in Gindi National Park with him. Uh, he, he, he was very inquisitive. He was very keen on documentation. He was very keen on us getting to know the bird, the ecology, its behavior, its nesting, its status, its conservation. Uh, for example, when, uh, uh, when I pointed out to him that the Layard's flycatcher or the brown-breasted flycatcher passes through Gindi National Park, he cocked his head and he said, did you know that it was named after a Tamil guy? Uh, Musikapa Mutui. And he said, Mutu was uh, Layard's most uh, favorite servant. And uh, one day Mutu brought uh, a specimen of this strange bird with completely white throat and uh, uh, large eyes and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. And Layard realized that it was a new species of bird and he named it after Mutu his favorite uh, servant. So uh, th th that, that, that anecdote uh, uh, stands out in me. Later on during the trip, as we were walking back to the uh, entrance of the park, uh, it was getting twilight, uh, and, he, and he looked at me and said, so you're leaving tomorrow. You know, you need to look for the spotted creeper. Uh, I have seen it just once or twice. I even had a, a little film taken one time. I wish you can find it. Let me know if you find it. So I made a note, and uh, in Bharatpur I recorded 300 species or so, but I was very keen to see the spotted creeper. Uh, I wrote to him about all the exciting finds of mine in Bharatpur. Every once in a while he would send me a reply, much to my delight. In one of his letters, uh, sometime in August of 1984, he wrote, Please look out for the spotted creeper. Uh, please, please look out for rarities, the spotted creeper for one. So I didn't need the reminder. I was looking for it every day. Well, I found the bird. In November 1984, I found the bird, and I uh, immediately wrote to him that very day uh, with excited shaking hands. And he wrote back saying he was coming next month to, to Bharatpur and that he hopes to go and find the bird with, him, with me. Uh, December 1984, the, one of the last days of December 1984, he came to Bharatpur. We had a, uh, a great walk together, just one-on-one. -on -one. I took him from the Keladio Temple uh, all the way to what we called E Block, uh, the big wetland. We were walking down the dikes lined with acacia trees. That's its favorite habitat, the spotted creepers. And I told the old man, sir, this is where I saw the bird. And uh, I was hoping to find it when, when a whole bunch of rickshaw men, rickshaw pullers came with a whole bunch of tourists. The tourists and the rickshaw men were excited seeing the, the Dr. Saab, uh, Salim Ali Saab, and they all uh, got off the rickshaw, rickshaw. They all wanted a photograph. And uh, it was all noise, and there were, there were loud speakers playing in the background. I was so frustrated because I thought I was so close to showing him the bird. I mean, this was a moment I had waited for uh, a long time. But through it all, the, the old man was very humble, very affectionate. He, he interacted with the local people. He answered their question. He didn't show any sign of uh, impatience or frustration. Uh, it, clearly, our agenda for that evening was interrupted. I showed more frustration than he did. And that, that was a good lesson to me that day. Uh, uh, on the way back, 
I had some one-on-one <coughs> uh, uh, -on -one time again with him. <coughs> and yeah, I remember him saying, uh, when I said, sir, uh, this is where I saw the dark gray bush cat, Saxicola ferrea. Uh, and he said, you know, that is very interesting. A British bird watcher told me of uh, seeing this bird in Kanna National Park, but he never published it. Uh, it, is, it is sad that these records are dead if, if you don't write and publish them. You know, that's a good point. And to this day, I pass that message to youngsters. I tell them, if you don't write it, it didn't happen because human memory is very frail. And if you don't uh, record it and document it and publish it, it's, it dies with you. It's lost to science. Um, I, uh, I got a lot out of uh, my two years working with him. He was a great man. He passed away in 1987 and not coincidentally, that was the year I left for the US. And uh, 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 I, I, he, he made me a great ornithologist. He didn't uh, uh, make me a twitcher and ticker, not that there is anything wrong with that, but he made me look at the bird. Uh, he, he made us great conservationists. He made us look at habitat. He made us uh, do grassroots conservationism. Uh, when one of, in one of his trips to Chennai, uh, Madras at that time, we told him about uh, Adair Estuary, how it's about to be destroyed, and how, can BNHS help us? He taught us a good lesson. He said, you know what? If BNHS gets involved, it will probably hurt your cause. You need to round up local support. It's the local people who need to make a noise. And that's what we did. And we managed to save a part of the, uh, of the estuary. Uh, of course, we lost most of it. But that's, that kind of grassroots conservation is what he always insisted on. Um, you know, he was a great man. Uh, it, I, what were the drawbacks? Uh, I don't know. He was very meticulous. Uh, if at all there was any negative thing about him, he was so conservative. He didn't, make, he didn't want to make any mistakes with identification. There were species like Philoscopus warblers and raptors he strongly believed cannot be identified in the field. I mean, how many times the handbook says, indistinguishable in the field unless in hand. And we were young people back then and we took it uh, for his word. We ignored the Philoscopus warblers. Now I realize that they're not impossible to identify in the field, especially if you look at habitat and vocalizations and some nuances in their appearance. Uh, but but it, it goes to say what a perfectionist he was, uh, how meticulous he was, he was. Maybe his partnership with Dr. Ripley, who was a museum guy, made him relegate that important responsibility to, the, to his partner who was specialized in museum characteristics. Um, so, so all my life, I, I ignored the tougher uh, taxa uh, and I focused on ecology. I focused on conservation. He made me a better ornithologist, a better bird watcher, and a better ecologist. Um, and above all, he made me a better man. Uh, he taught me humility. He taught me uh, the the... Uh, advantages of being meticulous and paying attention to detail. Uh, he taught me to listen, to use my ears. And to this day, my ears are my best asset in the field. Um, so very rarely does one get an opportunity to meet a man who drastically transforms one's uh, not only professional expertise, but also uh, the entire outlook. Uh, Salim Ali, uh, Dr. Salim Ali was one such person, and I'm truly honored to have uh, interacted with him. The two years I spent with him are the two best years of my life. Thank you.
I am delighted to be here as a part of Dr. Salim Ali anniversary celebrations and talking about my association, the Association of Embedders with Salim Ali. Let me start at the very beginning. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, when I was very young and I was a student, I came across books written by Kenneth Anderson. He wrote about his thrilling encounters with man-eating tigers and leopards and other assorted animals. And since these stories were set in South Indian jungles, many of which we were familiar with, we started visiting these jungles. Naturally, we didn't see many of the tigers and leopards that he wrote about, but we were able to see many birds, colorful, interesting, and very sweet sounding. But we were not able to identify any of the birds because Kenneth Anderson mentions maybe a few species of birds. I remember the gray jungle fowl, partridges, quails, and the did do eat bird. My brother introduced me to the sheer joy of IDing the uh, birds on, my, on our own using a field guide. Uh, there was only one field guide available at the time, which was the Book of Indian Birds, which one evening my brother brought home that to our great joy, we found plates of the birds that we uh, saw in the jungles on our visit. By modern standards, it had very few plates because the modern uh, field types have uh, the pictures of all the birds they describe. In contrast, Salim Ali's uh, Book of Indian Birds probably had 40 or 50 plates with descriptions accompanying all the birds. In fact, we found that uh, in our experience, even if we didn't have a look at the plate of the birds, Salim Ali with his masterful expression of the behavior of birds made us identify the birds even without the help of a plate. A little later, I was fortunate enough to be one of the 16 members who met at R.B. Mohan Rao's house, another bird watcher. This was the meeting at which uh, the concept of Madras Nat Naturalist Society was conceptualized and subsequently a society was uh, formed with the name Madras Naturalist Society. The Madras Naturalist Society uh, carried on with bird watching and uh, conducted various trips for its members. One year later, we thought it was time for celebrations. So we thought. So we brought out a souvenir. We sent a letter of request to Dr. Salim Ali asking for a message for the souvenir. Dr. Salim Ali wrote back, I will read it now. Personally, I feel that one year is too short a time for such celebration and that a minimum period of five years active existence would be a more appropriate period. So that was that. So we carried on with our celebrations. And true to his word, in 1983, he visited the Chennai and he addressed our members along with Dr. Professor Perrins of Edward Gray Institute of Ornithology in England. This meeting was held at CPR Center and uh, our members had the sheer joy of uh, meeting uh, Salim Ali in person and asking him questions and uh, Salim Ali patiently answered the questions of all the uh, members. For my part, I had questions but what I managed to do was just get an autograph in my bird book from the great man himself. But there is a sequel to this story. So he kept his word. After five years, from 1970, we were formed in 1978. In 1983, he addressed our members. But there is a sequel to the story. I didn't read out the second part of uh, Dr. Salim Ali's message. I will read it now. After saying that a minimum period of five years active existence would be a more appropriate period, 
for a celebration. He continues, However, I give you my blessings with the hope that the society will remain active as now and prosper in every other way. Now we are in 2020. We have existed and remained active for 42 years and uh, we have prospered in every other way. I like to believe that Dr. Salim Ali's blessings had a lot to do with this. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful morning this has been. The last two and a half hours just went by without any of us even realizing that it had gone by. And uh, MNS is uh, deeply indebt indebted to the eight narrators who took us through their experiences of uh, uh, meeting and working along with uh, Dr. Salim Ali. And I think uh, MNS is uh, extremely blessed to have received the, the, uh, uh, the Dr. Salim Ali's uh, blessings at the end of its first year of existence. And perhaps uh, that's, that may have singularly contributed to MNS's continued uh, uh, and existence uh, for the last 42 years, it's, and it's begun. I must say, it is uh, it's begun its 43rd year on a on a really wonderful note this morning, and uh, uh, very very grateful to all the uh, narrators for having brought out so many different facets of this wonderful person, Dr. Salim Ali, a very rare individual in this world. Uh, MNS is uh, equally grateful to BNHS, who permitted us to collaborate with it to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Salim Ali uh, during this 124th birthday anniversary celebrations that we have had. Um, MNS is uh, equally and very, very grateful to, am I audible to everybody? I think I am. Yes, yes. Yeah. MNS is uh, very, very grateful to uh, Umesh Mani. Uh, who has, I think in the last over uh, 10 days, spent a lot of time interacting with all the narrators whom we heard now, recording whatever they had to say, and uh, finally putting together this wonderful presentation, which we all saw. Umesh Bhai, MNS is very, very grateful to you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, before we conclude, uh, I think there have been a lot of accolades to both MNS, BNHS, narrators, and everybody else who were involved with this event over the last two days on our chat box. And I, on behalf of MNS, thank every one of you for the kind, for your kind words. And uh, thank one and all who took time off this morning to be with us to celebrate, truly celebrate the life and work of Dr. Salim Ali. And uh, before we close, I wish you and your family a very, very happy Deepavali. Thank you.